Everything we know, from people and ants, to stars and galaxies, to quarks and atoms, the entire universe, might just be a simulation running inside a supercomputer, inside an even bigger universe. Ancient philosophers said that the universe is a dream that we're waiting to wake up from. In this dream world of the imagination, anything is possible. All cultural items, from the dreams of our rodent-like ancestors, to books, to television shows, are merely permutations of the reality we think we live in. Today's age of computers and video games places simulations at the center of our cultural consciousness. A select group of us perform simulations for fun and profit, and we call them games, role-playing and otherwise. We live to run simulations. Join us on the Simulationist Podcast as we explore our culture of simulations. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Simulationist Podcast. This is the 132nd iteration of the show, recorded on the 15th of March, 2015. If you do your dates right, 15th of March on a Sunday equates out to us have just survived another Friday the 13th. We did, and we also survived Pi Day, although depending on how you order how you write the dates, it might be 14, 3... Well, that's why you always switch around to make it pie, whichever way you do it. Yeah. Uh, I will note, my wife did buy an apple pie yesterday. Yeah, yeah, I had a slice of apple pie. Yes, uh, so my wife did properly observe pie day by (laughs) buying a pie, which was on sale. I think the people at the store may have known about it. Um, Do I need to mention, though, the uh, alternative circle constant tau, which is twice pie, 6.28... It does make thought. sense in the fact that you do see a lot of, you know, like pi square or two pi sort of thing and all that, uh, or areas where it does make the math a lot easier. Uh, yeah, but I suppose we should leave it to our listeners if you're interested to uh, go ahead and do that little uh, research on your own. There's some interesting articles on there about why you should use tau instead of pi. Uh, if it's still an irrational number that repeats forever. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so long as you can convert it into a base 26, whereby instead of all any actual numbers, you convert them all to letters, and then you just keep on cycling through until you find uh, all of Shakespeare's works. I'm happy either way. Whether you use pi or tau to get there, I still want to see it happen. Okay. Oh, use both, because that way you double your odds of finding them. Yeah, yeah, it's, I'd say you would. Uh, that other voice that you're hearing on the other microphone, as uh, you are probably quite familiar with, if this is a, if you're a regular listener, if you're a Co-host new listener, co-host extraordinaire Ryan Kirkby. It is, and uh, the first voice you've heard today is uh, Josh Trelevin, host That's extraordinaire. Me. Yes, uh, the guy who talks first on the on the podcast. I'm sure the Germans have a term for that, but it would actually directly translate out into first speaker. Yeah. Yeah. I bet you it sounds cooler than just first speaker. Fürste Speaker. I think that's the um, the Swedish chef you're channeling there. Swedish, Swedish than German? Okay. Well, well, Swedish chef Swedish. Okay. How much Swedish it actually is is, you know, very rough at best. I thought I was doing good, but... I'm sure the Swedish chef thinks he's doing pretty good on that (laughs) one, too. I I wonder, yeah, how confident is this? He seems really like... He seems to feel like he's a real expert. Like he doesn't—he never flinches. He's never like, "Oh, I don't know what I'm doing now." He always knows exactly what he's supposed to do next. Or if he's surprised by something, yeah, he does have a backup plan. Yeah, there's always something else he could do. Which it always struck me as weird that they never included him more in the movies because he generally seemed like like almost like an A team sort of member. Like he's got a plan, and mm-hmm. his plan has a backup plan. Yeah. So you're you're busting into a place and something goes wrong. You want the Swedish chef with you as opposed to say Fozzie the bear, who's just gonna go walk a walk a walk and run away. Because he'll just the Swedish chef. He'll just happen to have a shotgun. <laughs> his uh, his culinary recipes do include a lot of small arms fire. I, I won't lie. <laughs> and a few large arms too, for that matter. And according to some of the stuff I've seen, bazookas, chainsaws, and axes. This is a very prepared chef that I would like uh, against my back uh, when things go down. <laughs> I, well, I would want him at a safe distance, but sure. Somewhere in the vicinity, maybe. Well, even then, I don't know. So now I have to start statting him up in Tristat, because he seems like he's got some sort of, like, you know, like, violent and superpowers. He's kind of like the Punisher, yeah. but a Muppet, and with much more exaggerated weaponry. I suppose, like, if I'm also... I- 
have Muppet physics applied to myself, then an explosion will just turn me black and, like, make my hair stick up or something like they that. They do have a guy who plays with dynamite, and he uh, manages to just laugh it off. So, yeah, I think you'd be Black okay. as in sooty, not black skin. But, okay. <laughs> they got Muppets of all colors. I'm pretty certain, you know, like, you, you could go up to straight before they consider you weird. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, Although, yeah, tie-dyed Muppet, man. They, like, forget, like, the Muppet actually wearing, like, a tie-dyed shirt, you know, like like the, the guys from uh, mm-hmm. Dr. Teeth. Like, the actual skin of the Muppet being all tie-dyed. Yeah. Did they... Oh, well. I don't think I ever saw that. I've ever seen that. I'll I have think to Gonzo might written. have done camouflage at some point, but... Yeah, but it's not the same. I mean, you know, like, you want that hippie aspect to it. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Yeah. yeah. So, uh, well, what have we been up to this week? Do you want to? You want to go? I've been mucking around in Minecraft, uh, starting up something uh, a little bit bigger for my projects. I started. I, I'm moving everything around uh, except for you know like my finished pieces in my city, mm-hmm. and uh, like uh, like the lava. I'm, I'm tired of it just sitting around in these puddles on the ground. Mm-hmm. I'm using the smeltery uh, stuff to build the blocks where I can put four uh, oh, and buckets. Which uh, which mod is this? Uh, well, uh, for that part, I'm using the uh, Tinker's Construct okay, mod. Okay, Tinker's Construct. Sweet. And that'll allow me to store four buckets worth of lava in a single block. And I'm okay. using that to, to light my streetways. It used to just be like a block of sandstone with a torch on top, but I find the added color, it adds, the splash it adds to there, really helps set the whole place alight and not like on fire. <laughs> so so those aren't flammable? Like No, no, I can actually no, I yeah. pick it away with a pickaxe and the whole thing pops out proper. Okay. So, uh, okay. and if I ever need the the magma from it, so I can just uh, you know grab a bucket and scoop it right on out. So, um, like when I finally do get to the Nether, it's like oh boy, like I don't have to just you know like go for the 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 whole uh, glowstone stuff. I can turn these lakes of lava into light sources. Mm-hmm. So I, so I, I'm happy with that. All right. So um, I have I've had my lysis doors for a while. And it's just pretty good stuff. You know, it's like, oh boy, fancy doors to open and close. Right. Um, but I'd never played around with their block masher. It's just uh, like uh, six bars of iron and two pistons to kind of, I guess, force them together. Okay. And basically what it does is it makes one side of the block of one type and one side of the block of another type. So you get any two blocks and you muck them together. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I was, I was doing that to... to make it so I don't have to have, like, double thick walls to get, like, different color on the inside as opposed to the outside. Okay. Yeah, sure. Because, you know, like, uh, I'm building, you know, like, a, a nice proper area for enchanting I and um, storage of, of goods and doing some alchemy work. And uh, it was like, well, you know, like, I don't want this to be the, the the brick style on the outside. I want this to look professional. So I'm going to get some of my uh, white stained clay and I'm going to smash the two blocks together. Um did find a downside in that uh, I can't put anything on those blocks. They don't register. Right. And like when you, you put your move your cursor over regular blocks so you can see the outline of each block you're, you're focused at, that doesn't happen. So if I keep this up, I can't put anything on the walls. Yeah, it's probably just like, it probably should happen. It's just a glitch. With the, the, the modders haven't built that into it yet. Uh, well, I said they... Uh, they they have like a like you got to use uh, Melissa stores. You have to have this other you know like thing to to add in there, mm-hmm. and that's for all the guys' works. And they did recently come out with an update, so I might back up my save and double check that out and see if that takes care of the issue. I don't consider it a problem though. It's not really a flaw. It's just a quirk of the whole thing. Sure. Yeah. Um. So I'm having some fun with that. Um. Turns out, yeah, with glass, you can have glass on one side and a solid brick on the other. You look at it from the solid brick side, it looks like an average solid brick. On the other side, it's like a one-way mirror. You're looking through. Yeah. Oh, I guess it's a one-way wall, really, because the other side isn't actually a mirror, but whatever. Just to go back to the torches for a second, like a little trick in Minecraft. I, I was trying to, like, think of ways that you could... One thing that people sometimes will do with torches, if they're a little bit tired of it, doesn't look good enough just having torches straight against the wall like just plop your torches directly onto the wall Mm -hmm. sometimes people will put like one fence block like a wooden fence up on the wall where you would normally put the torch in that spot on the wall and you put like like a block of wool and like on each side you'd have like a torch so effectively a kind of a chandelier style well you could do wool but I mean just to keep it various levels of uh, simplicity you could just do one block one 
wood fence, fence and then yeah. just torch on top. Mm. And the fence should connect to the blocks. Um, you might have to do some stuff, some build to it. Futs around with it first. But yeah. they, and then, yeah, so it looks the same. It looks a similar, like, you know, it's torches on the walls. It looks that style. But it's a little, slightly more fancy. And then, of course, you know, you can add a, more and more complexity and make fancy as chandeliers falling out. Hanging off your wall. There everything. is a nice chandelier over in my uh, my academy from the uh, the archaeology revival mod mm-hmm. that uh, I'm not ecstatic about it, but you know it sheds light, so whatever. I'm not going to rip it down or anything. Sure. Um, but the whole thing for torches in my my I get what to call it? Is it going to be like a wizard's tower? Is it going to be like a castle? I'm not 100% certain yet, but it is going to wind up being large and tall. so mm-hmm. And pretty darn fancy in some spots. Mm-hmm. But, uh, uh, yeah, I'll, I guess I'll, I'll just call it my wizard's tower, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to wind up uh, using some of the uh, the Thaumcraft uh, stuff to make a... Uh, it's a, like an arcane lamp. And what it does is... Uh, it generates light, like a torch. But any spot within a certain radius of it, if it's too dark, it'll send out like a mote of light to that. Because remember, only you can prevent zombie infestations. Hmm. And so I'll wind up putting a few of those well-placed around on the inside of it, uh, just to keep everything properly well-lit. And that way I won't need torches. I'm going to wind up having a whole lot of... T- I guess I'll take the torches down to the the uh, caves underneath the ground and start using them there. But uh, until that, you know, I'm going to wind up with a whole lot of spare torches in the foreseeable future. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I'm sorting stuff out, moving stuff around, uh, learning how to use little bits and pieces I hadn't used before. Like, I had always had a couple, like, um, millibars of uh, fluid stuck in my smeltery. And I'm like, well, you know what? If I'm going to have to take down my smeltery at some point, I should probably learn how to get this stuff out or lose it altogether. So that's why I started playing around with some of the blocks. It's like, oh, I can put, like, lava in these ones. And they show up and it's like, oh, they generate light. And so, yeah, I, I'm making a much more colorful city because of that. Um, it's still a mighty big city. I may have to start uh, doing some interesting work at finding a way to move faster so it doesn't take me so long to get from A to B. Hmm. But um, aside from running, eh, it's not it's not that big. It's not like I've got a huge pressing matter. I don't have a set amount of days I need to get this done by. Sure, yeah. So, so yeah, the biggest question right now is, do I want to take that block smasher and put a bunch of, like, brick on one side, clear glass on the other, and make it so that my wizard's tower looks like a solid wall on the outside, but on the inside there's these giant windows that let in light. Hmm. And that, jeez, uh, that sounds really appealing. So, like, I'll have to see how light flows through on the other way. I'll create a couple more, and then, you know, if light, uh, you know, actually flows out through them, like, even if it's a solid block on the outside, eh, maybe I won't keep it. Maybe I will have it be an open wizard's area. Okay, yeah. Not so seclusionist. Yeah. Um, that said, I am having a hard time enchanting a shovel to get uh, any sort of, like, silk touch enchant. Oh, yeah. Like, I know the grass ain't that great when it's, you know, in the desert, which is where I'm working, but it's still better than just plain dirt. Do you have anything silk touch? Uh, Pick or... I could use the, uh, uh, yeah, the Tinker's Construct to get, uh, uh, after a while, a silk touch thing. It does require a lot of gold, although I did recently find a few gold ore berries, so I do have an income of gold now. I can make that happen. Although what I could really use is some redstone for style de- and design. Okay. Like underneath my my <laughs> hole where I'm going to be making my my um, my uh, infusion altar, I want the core area to be like with that nice glowing redstone look to it. Um, I have like two handfuls of redstone dust though. I need a lot, so I've got to do a lot of exploring underground. Mm-hmm. <sighs> oh, well, I guess I'll have to be the explorer as opposed to the builder. I ha- I wear many yeah. hats in that game, <laughs> um, some much more willingly than others. Oh, well. Yeah. <laughs> but you know what? It's getting me good rewards. I've got decent, uh, like, I've got a decent income of both iron and gold now. More aluminum than I know what to do with. I can make bronze whenever I feel like it. And that's a pretty decent and low-grade uh, construction sort of thing. Looks good. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, does better for iron, uh, according to the stats in the, the Tinker's Construct. 
Better, like, uh, armor and tools? Uh, well, not armor. Uh, sadly, they don't really have any armor in the Tinker stuff. Um, oh, okay. The tools do mine a little faster, have a little bit more durability. Um, yeah, yeah bronze is not bad. It's better than iron in some cases. I remember reading something about the Not the as good as steel, but steel's a lot harder to come by in the Tinker stuff. you got to get fully repaired, uh, like, uh, mail stuff. The stuff that only drops off of, like, the, the enemies, right? The... The skeletons and the the zombies. So you got to get that. Yeah. Then you got to repair them up together until they're perfectly, you know, like uh, upgraded, you know, that so no damage on them. And then you got to toss them in the smelter, and that'll get you steel. So it's not very easy. Even though it should just be put it in like the uh, you know like the the furnace with some coal, and turn iron into steel that way. Yeah, that's how it is in some games. Like. Uh, what's well, you know, long story short, basically how it is in reality. But we're not working in reality. We're working in Minecraft. Yeah, uh, yeah. In Minecraft, the oak yeah. trees drop That's apples, it. so you know, take that as you will. Well, they're they're. Apple. They just called <laughs> it the oakle tree. The oakle tree. Yeah, well, come on, you know, have some fun with it. Make up a tree. Does it really matter if it's a real world tree? Call it the oakle. Oh, well, uh, in my language pack, like, just for my computer's uses, I just take out the names of the, mm-hmm. like, of the different woods. They're just all wood, because <laughs> I didn't like it. Because when I started, first started playing, they didn't have, like, names do not appear in-game. Like, yeah, yeah, I, when I played the the beta stuff, it was yeah. like, oh, hey, I'll test out this new game, see what it's like. Yeah, there was, like, I didn't even know I was working with a whole bunch of a hard-to-find obsidian in the beta, until I was like, oh, boy, I'm going to play a real version of, what do you mean it's hard to get? <laughs> what do you mean? I can't just find it in, in infinite quantities. Yeah, and I really like that because, like, that was Notch's d- deliberate design decision because he wanted the blocks. He wanted to do that so that he would be forced to make the blocks distinctive, so that he would, so that players would be like, "Oh, that's definitely." Well, they didn't know some of them, but this obsidian is definitely this, you know, this hard stuff, and they can name it whatever they want to name it. Um, as opposed to him saying, it, rather than it being sort of this text-based game where like, oh, you have a block of obsidian, it says in text, and you're like, well, I guess I have to imagine that I have a block of obsidian, where it's he went the opposite way with actually like picturing. like. I think that's for the best. If, if uh, Minecraft was just like a text adventure, it would not have done anywhere near as well. Yeah, well, and that's basically what Dwarf Fortress is. Uh, well, it's an <laughs> ASCII sort of thing, so it's, yeah. it's some sort of crazy... Hybrid. Although the colors are somewhat unique, there's mm-hmm. only uh, two uh, stones that are light blue in color. One of which is microcline, which you know is like, damn it, why do I have more microcline? It keeps showing up on here. Ah, and the other is the wonderful adamantine itself. Mm. So it's like, oh boy, look at this nice light blue stone I've got everywhere. Did you make that out of adamantine? No, dude, it's just, just microcline. Just, just microcline. You're confusing the two. <laughs> oh. Yeah, uh, that's okay because I mean some of the stuff like uh, like garnerite uh, gets you nickel. Oh boy, nickel! I always wanted more nickel in my fortress. No, no, no. Nickel's kind of like eh, whatever. Use it to make some alloys. Okay, but the garnerite itself is green, like mm-hmm. a nice bright green. It's like oh, I could do so much with that and make nice bright green floor tiles and, and like like make uh, you know messages to myself going here and there. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, so yeah, sometimes it's better off just having it uh, be whatever. Mm-hmm. Of course, I said, I mean, this is coming from a guy who mined out the side of a mountain of uh, clay so he can get colored clays. Mm. <laughs> and I really do like, well, not all the colored clays. The uh, uh-huh. As I said before, the yellow looks like a spicy mustard. Um, yeah, although, I, although in lieu of actual bronze, from a distance, I am using it to to do the top of my tower to make it look oh, yeah. like like one of them Agrabah, you know, style mosque dome things. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah, it's not bad that way. Um, the red is nice. I really do like the smooth color on it. The black is not dark enough for me. It seems like a, just a dark brown, but whatever. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. What? Yeah, you the could use coal, looks, I guess. Yeah, that's the thing. Coal's a little harder to come by. Yeah. Um, that said, with the smeltery stuff on there, I could take a lot of cobblestone and turn it into some. Um, it's called uh, like a, like a scorch stone. So imagine something between the color of regular stone and uh, the foundation stone. You know, the stuff at the very bottom, the, the bedrock. Oh yeah. yeah. 
And it's uh, a lot like a mix of those ones. And you can mm-hmm. do some fun stuff with that by chiseling it out. So I can get some nice patterns on there. Uh, that's, I think, what I think I'm going to wind up doing in the end. Hmm. I think. Okay. Not certain yeah. on that one. But I am going to have to do a lot of exploring, which means I'm going to have to set up some stuff, go to another world sort of thing. We're just going to wind up delaying my trip to the nether even longer. Oh, yeah. I need a lot of cows. And I, I'm not going to go to venturing through cows through the desert sort of thing, so I'm going to have to pull them in through different worlds. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, I mean, this is Minecraft. I mean, if you want to build, like, a your own sort of, like, a, you know, like, a proper fireplace, you have to go to hell to mine some stone to set it on fire to create your own little fireplace proper. Well, if you want an internal fire... If you want a fireplace that you can just, you know, get a stack of wood and put it in a chest near the fire, and when you need a fire, grab a one block, one log out of your stack put it in the fireplace, light it on fire, and then let it burn. When it burns out, put another log on. But you'd think in a world with, like, uh, eternally burning torches, it'd be a little easier to get an eternally burning uh, fireplace without having to go to hell to mine it for resources. Mm. Which, by the way, I'm not really complaining about. I mean, that's, (laughs) you know, like, throw up the horns. That's rocking bad (laughs) arts there, man. (laughs) So I want a better fireplace. Better go to hell and get some materials. (laughs) Yeah. But uh, but yeah, now that I, I figure that I can turn four buckets of uh, magma into a block of light, and I can take out all the torches, my, and I got a lot of areas where I'm going to need the tor uh, to replace torches. So I'm I'm going to need to go to the Nether just for the lava oceans they have, lava seas, lava oceans. What do they qualify as? Just seas? It is pretty much underground there, isn't it? I would call them lakes. I mean they're. They're Lakes big. Fire? For, they're big okay, for Minecraft, way. but um, they're nothing compared to the ocean. Yeah, I'd say like at the biggest, they're probably three or four hundred meters across, and then before they get interrupted by something else. Hmm. Okay. It's like the land of a thousand lakes of lava. <laughs> the land of lakes of lava. So the next big question for me is, given my, my, my obsessive nature of perfectly getting everything out of this, is how the heck am I going to get rid of the lake of, of, of lava when I'm in the nether without, you know, like, ah, oh, like how, how can I reach anything and the lava is still flowing towards me and all that, so I'm going to have to start, like, taking off sectors and just, you know, like, uh, effectively blocking stuff off as I slowly, you know, like, process an entire lake down into glowing blocks for me. <laughs> Because that's the horrible person I am. Mm, I will, yeah. I will, even, you know, hell itself is not horrible enough for me. I, I will turn it into a construction site. Rah! Well, there are mods, I think, uh, I've seen, I don't know which mod exactly it is, but Feed the Beast has a mod, it might be... That allows you to suck up the liquid. But yeah, you yeah. use a, like a drill or a... Pump, I guess. Yes, I've seen the pumps in the uh, the Moon Quest stuff where they were getting up all sorts of fun, like liquid alumites, which is yeah. a very nice red color. If I could get enough of that, I might replace uh, the uh, or the base area where I want it uh, with uh, from the redstone. So they're both a very nice dark shade that works well. Mm-hmm. Whatever I come across first. I mean, the last time I tried going to a new world in Minecraft, thanks to the Mistcraft mod, I wound up with lakes of seared stone. It's like, no, 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 they're not even lakes of lava. This is just like molten stone. Mm. Jump in there and burn. So I was like, oh, okay, I guess I could do that. You know, I guess there's no water in this actual world, whatever. But, uh, Mm -hmm. you know what, I do, like, I've had some crazy worlds exploring. Like, there was one where there's like three suns going around at different speeds. So oh, it's yeah. like, <laughs> like wow, I'm adventuring around. This is a really long day. Oh, but it's getting night, so I'll go back to my, my base point and fall asleep. Ah, and then I wake up the next day, and it's like, I'll go exploring again. And it's like, three minutes later, it's night again, because it was only the one sun up, and the other suns hadn't come up yet. And so it's like a really quick sun going through there. That's like, oh, wow, it got really dark really quickly. I'm going to yeah. have to run or barricade myself in for a few minutes. Mm-hmm. And that, uh, I mean... Once you get started up, a, you know, in a game like Minecraft, and you get that little defensive thing set up, it, you know, you don't really have to worry too much about the night. And then, you know, you go to a place like this where effectively you start fresh with just better gear, like New Game Plus, right? And it's all of a sudden it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa! I have to put a bunch of like dirt around myself and make sure I'm safe for the night. So it's 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 nice to go back to the basic style. Mm. 
But uh, that was that was I guess my my biggest thing uh, this week. Although I have been trying to to work on a proper adventure and write it up decent for fifth edition. Oh, good. Yep. Yep. Um, so you know, like uh, last uh, last week after we uh, finished our uh, recording, uh, we did a little work on the thing. You know, tried a little uh, scene out, and I learned from it. I saw the stuff. I saw what worked for us, what didn't work. I got some input. I'll try and get more input. And I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna improve. And my goal is to have like a, a, an adventure that I could run at Godacon next year. Which, if I do have it ready, then I guess I will. That's my big goal for the year. That's my my I'm gonna get something done this year. Yeah, that's true. Also, yeah, if you're a GM, and I think it's for every event that you run, you get a day of free pass. Ooh. So if you ran three things, then you would have all the, all three days covered. That said, I could just cop out. Take my hero quest with me, and then just you know like do okay we got like four hours to play like a like a map in hero quest. We got four people. Let's go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You can Although do that. actually I do. Have oh, they have a whole. I mean, yeah. basically they have open gaming, so you mm-hmm. can just bring a game and just. I'm sure you can gather because that seems to be the way it goes. Is people just say, "Hey, I'm running a thing. Who wants to play?" Well, that's the thing is, I remember a couple of years ago when they had two uh, uh, copies of the Hero Quest board game there, and they sold for really good, uh, you know, high prices. Like I think it was sixty, eighty bucks for for the two of them, and they were not in good condition. They they uh-huh. had been well loved. <laughs> um, so uh, clearly, they are an in demand board game. So the chance to sit down and play something that's out of print likely will never effectively be back in print. Um, although I suppose it's not like the map is an unknown sort of thing with a proper like a like a map sheet to to write and doodle the whole thing on. You could just get yourself some of the Warhammer minis. You could effectively recreate it. Like um, I'm not ashamed to say I have PDF copies of all the the, the Hero Quest stuff on my little netbook. If I ever want to look up, okay, what does it say for this? What are, what are they mentioning on that? It's all there. I don't feel bad about it because the game was published. Uh, let's see, I think it was 1990. So yeah, that's no, 2000. Yeah, oh geez, that's almost a, like a quarter century ago that it's been out of print. I don't feel bad for having a PDF copy of something like that. Mm-hmm. Hmm. That's my moralizing of it. I, I don't. No, think, oh, I don't yeah. think Parker Brothers is going to wind up suing me because I have a copy of something they're not making anymore. Uh, no, not if you have a copy. I think they might sue somebody if they were distributing it still, mm. but they have to find them first and have to find it worthwhile. So, And I think you'd have to pr- also prove that uh, you were making a profit off of their stuff. So if, if you're distributing it for free, still kind of an up hard, uh, up, uphill fight, uh, hard uh, for them to succeed for in the court of law. Well, if, if you're a nobody, yeah, yeah, it's easy enough. Um, if you If you have some kind of other business... Then they can somehow they can threaten that, but yeah, if yeah. you're just a guy in your basement, uh, then yeah, playing it for your friends, game. give them, make sure they got copies so they know how to play the game, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I, I do have the expansion pack, so technically I could make it up to a six-person party on that, and just you know like, uh, and from what I've I've experienced, the first map alone usually takes about as long as a full adventure, ca- you know, sort of thing going on uh, for the mm-hmm. tabletop stuff, so it could fit out well, mm-hmm. and maybe. Maybe with a group of six, somebody wouldn't die in the first adventure. Because I have yet to ha- play that, that first map on Hero Quest where it, somebody doesn't die. Mm-hmm. Uh, usually the elf dies. Don't know why. But, um, the elf has low hit points. Yeah, but the he elf also it. has a choice of magic. So the elf can get some healing. Elf could do, like, oh, I'm going with fire spells. I will blast you from a distance. Rah! Yeah. Um, but I, I have noticed that once that first character dies, everyone else is like, okay, no more of this, you know, amateur hour crap. We're <laughs> right. going together. Okay. This guy goes in first. He's in there. And there. You're bringing up the rear dwarf and we are going to, okay, now you go into the corner and then we'll search properly. And that way, you know, if anyone uh, tries to come at you, they are blocked in. We can really get them all. Rrr, wandering monsters we don't fear. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so it would be, uh, uh, you know, uh, I think a good thing for everyone to learn the lesson. It's just kind of sucks that someone has to die to learn that lesson. Yeah, well, I remember reading somebody on a forum thread not long ago, one of the many D&D forums out there. He was a a relatively new DM, and he had this brilliant idea. He says, like, I'm such a genius, I came up with this brilliant idea. I am going to include a DM PC or an NPC that accompanies the party, you know, that looks like another character. Um, And the 
only reason to that I'm in doing this is because when they get to a major fight, I'm just going to have them die, like, instantly. And that'll get the PCs, you know, on edge or, you know. And I was saying, okay, you know, that's not a bad idea. Lord knows <laughs> a lot of the Conan stories work that way. It's like, oh, boy, an adventure. Oh, someone else is dead. Oh, someone else. Everybody dies around Conan. Yeah. Not because of him. <laughs> But just because of the horrible world they well, live in. Well, and partly because of the writer saying, hey, I need this bad guy to look really deadly. And so, oh, who's the convenient? The traps must be horrible. This guy wearing a nice red shirt? Who is more likely to shirt? die in assaulting the Tower of the Elephant? This, uh, you know, novice barbarian from, uh, you know, untamed lands? Or the King of Thieves? Well, the King of Thieves gets bitten by a spider as large as a dog and then dies. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, no, no, Conan don't die. Conan doesn't succumb from that. Not an easy fight for him, I, I won't lie, but um, not not like a, you know, like a, like he was ever in any real threat. So, yeah, my my only real major problem with this solution is that it really works once. Mm-hmm. Like, you can do that whole, like, oh, I'm making an NPC to go along with you. Oh, no, look, they died horribly. That works one time. If you do it again, <laughs> the party's going to be like, hey... This always happens to us. Are we cursed? Or you know. Could we resurrect him? Oh, no, we don't have the spell for that. Could we just animate dead and make him look like he's alive? So bring him along for him? every fight. <laughs> he gets killed every time. Oh, there goes the zombie, uh, you know, torchbearer again. Oh, well, just find the body parts, put them all back together, get the duct tape of healing. They do have that as a magic item, right? Duct tape of healing? Um, well, I'm sure you could find it in maybe D20... No, D20 I know they Modern... Have it, I D- know they used it in Nodwick stuff, and so I think oh, they yeah. probably have stats for it somewhere. Well, I, I, it's, I guess it's just a reskinned scroll of healing, basically. Yeah. Or, or a wand of healing that, as you use a charge, you have to rip off a little piece of the wand. I think that's effectively what they worked it as. I think I, it's been a long time. If I even saw the stats, I believe that's how they worked it. I suppose, yeah, almost any wand could be reskinned as duct ta- like a roll of tape of that wand, and it's like charge, rip, charge, rip. You know, rip a foot long stretch, and uh. it gets used up. Or how about like um like how how they have uh, some of the stuff in like those um those Wu Sha movies, where you know like uh the person like writes like an imperial edict on a piece of paper and they like staple it to like the, the zombie's forehead and then the zombie you know because the edict says don't move the zombie's paralyzed oh that's and there's effectively just be like a whole dead thing just stuck on there so in that case you know like uh, instead of duct tape it'd just be like a long sheet of imperial edicts you got to find the right one to smack on someone's forehead yeah i like it yeah that could be what Oh, that it's could be crazy a wand reskin, a reskin wand, yeah, it's just a roll of paper. Or I guess <laughs> in that case it wind up being a scroll, because it's a scroll. one-time use sort of thing, and I yeah. guess it works as close to a scroll, because it's like 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 a roll of paper, you know, stick it, there you go. It's well, got three M strips on each end. I remember D&D also, like, the way scrolls work, I'm not sure if, it might have changed over editions, but I'm not sure if when you read a scroll, like a scroll that has a spell stored on it... It's supposed to burn away. Does it just... Well, and does the paper all disintegrate too, or do the words just disappear and it becomes like regular parchment that you could reuse? Uh, I think in the, as of third edition, the uh, parchment uh, doesn't burn away. Because you can store multiple like uh, spells. On yeah, that's thing. what I was thinking. You can have um, multiple s- spells, but it isn't quality enough to write again on. So you um. can't scribe the scroll again. You know, like back onto there. You got to get all new components and all that. Right, because it also costs the money in components to get hmm. to s- scribe scrolls in D and D. Although they did have the effects for like uh, using it as a charge. You know, like uh, like five up to five charges a day. Mm-hmm. So what you could do is like have a scroll, effectively be a permanent magical item that does the spell, and then the words burn away, but then they like come back uh, again the next day. Yeah, okay, that would be like a special item, but sure, or well, a special be, it, new it, class well, of items. Well, I, I guess it'd just be a miscellaneous sort of item, sort of thing that mimics the scroll appearance. Mm-hmm. Um, because that's the one thing. It's like, oh boy, I'm looking at all the wonderful magical items of fifth edition. It's like, oh, uses up charges and then it's gone. It's like, well. 
Yay. I guess that's the other thing about D&D is it's very standardized. It's like, okay, scrolls work this way in D&D, which makes sense because you need rules and stuff. Yeah. But if you think about like what the world that the players inhabit with all these multiple arcane traditions, there probably would be like, oh, these scrolls work this way or these scrolls are reusable and, you know, sort of different schools have different ways of doing it. Different arcane traditions, yeah. Yeah, and that would be... I mean, that's just another layer of complexity that maybe DMs don't want to deal with. I mean, like, the wizard players are like, okay, so this scroll that I've got in the treasure hoard, okay, uh, is it one-time use, or is it this and that, or what, you know, how many... Yeah. Although, I must admit, in 5th edition, it has uh, brought me back to some stuff in the fighting fantasy series. Uh, what they had was, like, a, an area in there where, like, they had mask magic, and uh, instead of casting a spell like a wizard, the person would put on a specific mask and intone like the spirits were connected to the mask and the symbols on there mm-hmm. and have the spell uh, apply. And I'm reading that, you know, uh, the, the whole stuff about like ritual spells in 5th edition. I'm like, I could apply that as like, a, like through the mask sort of thing. Like you have the mask, you can utilize the spell as a ritual. You okay. can't do it in combat, but the spell works. It's like, oh... I'm able to bring something from like back in the 80s with a fighting fantasy style hmm. and have it work with the mechanics of 5th edition. It's very simplistic that way. And it's like, oh, interesting. Very interesting. I might have to limit it to like definitely like a once a day sort of thing for mm-hmm. for it. But uh, but yeah, I, I can make it happen. And that's, that's nice to see that 5th edition is uh, flexible enough to allow that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it does definitely make me want to like reread all my old stuff again, like all all the old stuff from like because I gotta say the fighting fantasy was hmm, not that far off of like first edition D and D, kind of basic, but it was so full of ideas and fluff. It just makes me want to go through all that sort of stuff and uh, check it out. It makes me want to read my manual for like the original Diablo book uh, mm-hmm. that I've got there. And just to see, like, uh, what sort of flavor do they have for that stuff? Mm. Can I make this work? Can I do, like, demon lords and all that sort of thing? Can I make them, like, work to bring the dead back up and all that and make a horrible world for heroes to rise and save the day? And uh, and that's, that's making me very happy about 5th edition. Oh, um, but before we do go anything else uh, on there, I do want to alert people to free D&D content. Um, so they're doing an adventure campaign around, like, the... Uh, Elemental evil stuff. Um, Wizards of the Coast? Yes, yes. Uh, because, well, you know, like... Uh, yeah, I mean, that's like one of their classic stuff. You know, like Adventures was, you know, the Temple of Elemental Evil and Return to the Temple of Elemental Evil. Mm-hmm. And they're definitely bringing some of that stuff back in. Like, if you if you read the um, the uh, Inner Plane stuff for the Plane of Air, they they definitely have a heavy mention on the Lords of... Was it Aka? A-Q-A-A? I, I've never known how to pronounce that. Hmm. Aka? Uh, oh, the Wind Dukes, those guys? Yes, the Wind Dukes, which uh, is from the whole adventure of the Rod of Seven Parts. Mm-hmm. So they clearly want to take like their classic adventure stuff, the big the big name stuff that really made, uh, you know, and, and shook things up back in the day. And so they really want to be putting that stuff in. And uh, so, yeah, I, there's no, like, no wonder they want to do, like, oh, Temple of Elemental Evil. It's like a renowned, horrible adventure that kills all sorts of people off. Let's have some fun with it. Mm-hmm. Um, and what they have for this is going to be like a player's companion to the the uh, st- uh, I guess camp- uh, official campaign arc, official campaign setting sort of thing. It, it does take place in I believe it's the Greyhawk world for that, mm-hmm. or no? I, oh, I think it's actually gonna, uh, supposed to take place in uh, the Forgotten Realms. Sorry, okay, for this bit. But um, the player's companion is going to be like, oh boy, here's the races we mentioned in these books, and here's the spells we have here, and the magic items, you know, and all that stuff. Okay, so and new races, new cl- new spells? Yeah, new races, new spells, and all that, and it's all put in there without any spoilers. So you, as a player, can buy it, and uh, take it to the table as the DM goes through the adventure stuff without having to worry about, you know, like, oh, by the way, I read what's going to happen. I dodged the poison arrow coming out of the uh, the gargoyle's mouth. Hmm. I, I think that's nice. Um, the races are... are um, they got the new uh, gnome subtype, the uh, Sferf Neblin, which I probably am not pronouncing right. I've never pronounced them right. The uh, Sferfs. Yeah, I, I would, I've would. i always said Sferf Neblin. Oh, okay. In so that case, either we're getting it wrong the same way together or we're getting <laughs> it right, which is <laughs> equally good for me. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, they got them as a subtype sort of thing. Um, 
They've got all four of the Genasi types, you know, the elemental uh, kin sort of thing. They are to the elementals as the tiefling is to a demon. So there mm-hmm. you go, now you know. Uh, and then they've got the Goliath, uh, which I believe was introduced in the 3.5 races books. Um, very nice, very even. I am still looking forward to some uh, Krinish races popping up, Kender, Minotaurs, Golly Dwarves, and, and such and so forth. Mm-hmm. And maybe even the different types of uh, Dragonborn Draconians to see how that works out. But that will sate my interest until then. Uh, so yeah, you go to like drivethroughrpg.com. Um, if you have an account, yeah, just go in. If you don't, sign up. It's free, whatever. And they they have a few things there that you can get for free. Uh, you know, and this this one is is fifth edition. So yay, f- free fifth edition content. Um, and it also marks the start of the expansion. In every edition, you get your three core books, and then other stuff starts coming out. An adventure here, a campaign world there. And then, you know, next thing you know, you've got two shelves full of books, like a hundred different races to choose from, all these different options. Um, and so, like, when 3rd edition just started coming out, it's like it was a much different uh, thing than what 3rd edition is, you know, at its end. Uh, when 3.5 was, you know, and, you know, ended before they announced, like, uh, Pathfinder and 4th edition, the, the split. Uh, and so this marks the change, uh, where you have more elbow room or shoulder room, or you know, just just more area to 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 be anything and anyone in any way. It's like ah, so go there, check it out, read it. It's good reading. Uh, they will watermark your stuff. So uh, like if you see your name in like the bottom left corner, don't freak out. Say, oh my goodness, why is my name there? No, that's the watermark. Whatever name you're you're listed as there, that's what they put in there, and uh, that's how they know. It was you who illegally distributed the free content. Why you got to do that? Mm-hmm. It's free. Just have people go there, like I'm telling you to do now. Yeah. So, yay! Free stuff. Yep, free Ooh. free content for adventures. Yeah. Uh, well, the thing is, it's not necessarily for adventures. I mean, for, you know, like if you just want to, to be like a more elemental styled uh, wizard, hey, there's some more spells for you. You want to, you know... Be something off. You know, maybe maybe the dragonborn weren't your thing. Maybe tieflings are played out for you. Maybe you don't want the standard you know, races with the funny hats. You know, like the halfling, gnome, and uh, dwarf and elf. And maybe you just don't, if you want to be a human, you be the real life you. So this is some interesting different options for you. Play something you know like a little crazy, a little different. Yay! All right. Cool. So yeah, that's I want cool. to announce that to the world. Yeah. Um, that, uh, that and that's, was yeah, that's, that's basically been my week what and what I've, I've learned and read and done. What you've, yeah, okay, cool. So how about you then, Josh? What's, uh, what's up in your world? Uh, I booted up Minecraft again. Oh, got the dust off it, eh? Yeah, dusted it off. Updated my Java, because I had to, because, and then I had to update my Forge, because that made, Java updating made Forge crash. No, um, you know, oh, it's good to have the latest version of Forge anyways. If you got mods, well, better compatibility, yeah. the higher the numbers. I have... Forge 1.7, even though 1.8 is working, I haven't updated. I have to update all my mods to oh, to, yeah. the, to get 1.8, and it's not quite ready. But anyways, yeah. So um, I have been working on uh, doing a bit of like ranching and sort of designing. Um, I don't like to do the real compact, like you know, people move around uh, cows and pigs with uh, water streams and stuff and like Mm. pistons and and stuff I don't necessarily do any of that but I do like to create kind of a like a long building that they can like that I can herd them through Uh. to get them to you know okay here's a slaughter area here's a breeding area here's the the pasture where they do you have a different area for slaughter breeding and pasture Um, well just breed (laughs) them in the pasture and then slaughter them when there's too many of them I feel I feel horribly <laughs> crude now. That's actually that. I mean, uh, how long have I been playing Minecraft? And I finally get around mm. to building all this this infrastructure. So yeah, yeah you're talking to a guy it. that still yeah. hasn't really been into the Nether at all. So you, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so most of the time, I have been just doing it. The you just breed them right there and then kill one of the parents, <laughs> and that's how you do. Well, that's the thing. I always went with three breeding rounds followed by slaughter all the adults. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that way I have an in- gradually increasing uh, uh, herd size until I get to a point where I, was, ah, I don't need all these dang cows and just cut them down to like a, I think a, usually an eight pack. Yeah, but my idea is what I want to get going is kind of have like a whole like 
sort of countryside that's sort of ranch land because you know oh. ranches you, are big places. Yeah, you drive through you know the central of, of BC and you, it's trust you know, me, ranch trust country. Me, I, I live next to Alberta. <laughs> I've seen big ranches or, or Alberta for that matter. And yeah, you see like you know hundreds of cows on a hillside, and like I want that for my Minecraft. You know, if it wasn't for the constant threat of like uh, Ender teleportation, I wouldn't mind having a vast field of of just you know like wheat growing as far as the eye can see. Mm, yeah, um, I've seen people try like I've seen screenshots of people who do that in my life. But the big problem for me has always been you know like oh yeah, as soon as you, you look you know elsewhere, as soon as it gets you know night or there's, as soon as there's a cave in the area, an Enderman will eventually portal up there and just start popping all your wheat away. It's like duh. <laughs> Yeah, it's true. Like, a lot of people, you know, don't like the the creeper, but I can handle the creeper pretty easy. I can handle two or three creepers at once sometimes, but those Endermen, it's just, oh, they, <laughs> they get under my skin, and, and not like those Endermites, just like, ooh, horrible. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, so that's what I've been, uh, um, I think that's a bit, I had more improv today, but not much to report. I mean, I had lots of, lots of fun, so. Did you find any free content on the internet? Oh, <laughs> it's the internet. It's like all free content. <laughs> Probably, but yeah, maybe nothing that I can comment on. At least, right? Not that because I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Walk yourself into a corner, there, buddy. Um, but also, I sh- I have a couple of things I wanted to mention about going around, going on in Victoria, in the real world, in, in real life, in this uh, little corner of the Pacific Northwest where we live. Um, we have Roll for Initiative is a monthly D and D event that invites sort of anyone who can come and participate in to and pay the entry fee. Uh, there is an entry free. fee. It's ten dollars now for players, and it's I think it's only like two dollars for DMs. Ah. So if you decide that you can be a DM, it's I, it's intended to be all fifth edition, uh-huh. um, but I, I I mean talk to our our friends there. Um, so is it like uh, for the DMs? Do they get given an adventure to do, or is it like uh, they have to come in with their own? Uh, actually, I'm not sure. I guess I think it's anything fifth edition. But um, so yeah. once I get my campaign, you know, like written up and got a good oh yeah, you could bring it there. I could bring it in there and give it like a play test sort of thing. Yeah. So it happens mm-hmm. on the next scheduled one of these things it's once a month so it's March 28th that's yeah. a Saturday and it starts at like 4 so I don't know if that's you that's PM right it's not like a get there <laughs> before the sun rises oh uh, one of these days I would <laughs> love to play like a 4am D&D maybe next year at Godicon we can like it, it can't be at the convention because they don't open the doors till I don't know 7 but don't they but effectively go like like 24 like after like Friday evening into Saturday morning to Saturday evening to Sunday they evening? had to at least I think this year, since they were in this um, oh, the convention venue, center. the convention center, I think the convention center has to shut down for, I don't know... Maintenance, uh, cleaning, yeah. get the Cheeto out of the carpet. Yeah, at least a few hours. Uh, That's probably for the best. I yes. do remember some people with a, a, a mesquite funk and a very dazed uh, look in their eye in some previous years. So, okay, yeah, yeah, for the best. Everyone go home, get four hours sleep, have a shower, meet you back here. Yep. Uh, so come to Roll for Initiative. If you're in Victoria, uh, we would love to see you down there. Um, at uh, well, down there, it's it's up in like um, u- near the university. Ah, yes. Um, so it's near the circle. So it's higher than uptown, I guess, because <laughs> it's yeah, way up in in Saanich. Um Northwest of Cadboro Bay. Yeah. Uh, and also another thing happening in Victoria. Is there is uh, there's a game jam, um, a board game jam. We have these every once in a while. There's um, Level Up does, does video game jams, which are fun too. But the thing I like about board game jams is you don't have to lug a whole, you know, like well, I guess the laptop's not that extreme, but you don't have to bring you know junk to the venue. You mm-hmm. just come show up. I guess you probably could design board games on laptops. I mean, they they probably do that. Yeah, yeah, you can make that work. Um, but the idea you, the money's in apps these days, so if you can create a shared app board game, well, that's you yeah, might that's have true. your next Flappy Birds. 
so anyways, there is a game jam happening um, this, n- not this, April 11th and 12th. Is It's a two-day game jam. You can show up as much time as you can. I, they're intended, they're supposed to be, you're, you're very intensive, and you sort of show up in the morning on the Saturday, and you stay all day, and you work, and you work, and you work. And by the end of 48 hours or whatever, it's, it's around there, um, you come out with a completed something, something that you can actually play, like a board game. Because remember, sometimes it's not that you have to get the creative juices to flow, but that they need to get pulped out of you. <laughs> so they've got to get the high intensity and get the pressure going. Yeah, uh, 99% perspiration, 1% inspiration, or whatever, however, however the percentages break down, I don't remember. 7% mathematical instability. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and 10%, yeah. Um so that's happening, and oh, now I can't remember. I'll put it in the show notes for this episode, so if you're interested in that, you are in Victoria. And on April 11th, 12th, uh, show up to that. This one is also, it's, I think it's $10, so not a lot of $10 things that I'm sort of plugging right now. That's but not bad, though. $10, <laughs> this is uh, pretty darn reasonable. Uh, yeah, I think that's so. That's like one As hour's worth of work, you know, you just yeah. get an extra hour overtime sometime wherever you're working, and uh, then uh, you paid for it. Yeah, although I suppose with Game Jam, it's like, oh, pay you $10, and now I get to work nonstop for, 20, for 48 hours. But no, at the end, hopefully it, it hopefully it really does help you out mm-hmm. with, you know, just it, whether you're, it doesn't matter if you're a professional or if you're just doing it for fun or whatever. Well, it does remove you from all the distractions. Like, I could get so much done if it wasn't for the internet <laughs> and my yeah. family yeah. and the television and yeah. all these exciting books I've got. If I could just, you know, find a nice, like, suitable work spot to, to sit down and really focus my efforts, I could probably get uh, most of, like, that adventure I'm working on done by the end of 48 hours. There is, yeah, and uh, there is something to be said for working, like, just being, like, yourself because y- you have a bit of experience with your own work habits and patterns and and you know that if you can eliminate distractions you could you know come up with something pretty awesome. Mm. However, the other advantage of game jams is the fact that there's going to be other people there and there's there there's that opportunity to collaborate. Um and I just want to say about collaboration, there is a risk there because I had this like going to university so probably our listeners probably had similar experiences most of I imagine we have a fair split of people who are university educated and people who are not yet or still in university um, but when you work with groups it's sometimes it's hit or miss and sometimes you're like oh one person does all the work or whatever mm. but I would just encourage like as long as the stakes are relatively low like you're not expected to produce you know Settlers of Catan or something like that in a weekend. That takes at least three days, not two. (laughs) Um, As long as that's understood and sort of, and you're entering it with a good nature and then just be willing to work with a team, I would say that's probably the biggest opportunity is Mm -hmm. the fact that you get to experience these collaborative processes where um, in sort of, most of us sort of work by ourselves and create something as an individual, as one person. Remember, it is the Parker Brothers, not that <laughs> Parker guy. Yeah. Well, although the Parker Brothers, I think a lot of what they did was just take sort of what was already out there and just... Buy it. They either bought it or stole it or... Because uh, yeah. you could do that back then. You know, so it's a board game. Of course I can steal it. Yeah. Slap yeah. stuff on. It says oligarchy. I'll call it Monopoly. Put some rich guy with money bags on there instead of a king. Bam. It's mine now. Ha <laughs> ha. Yep. Uh, so yeah, so game jams, game jams happening, coming up soon, and uh, and role playing events and all that cool stuff. So uh, meet us there. We are a bit of a gaming mecca for a place our size. So there's a lot going on and a lot to be done. I think so. Yeah, I mean we're just uh, at, we're just across the water from Seattle, which is you know the home of Wizards of the Coast and a number of other great companies and stuff. So mm. there's that. Um, yeah. It is a nice place to be. Uh, I've been told driving around Seattle mine is a bit of a nightmare. Yeah, well, personally, I mean, I'd say like take public transit for all of our listeners, uh, all of our listeners who are in Seattle. I don't know how many we, mm, a few of them might be in Seattle. Um, I recommend Victoria. I might, like come up here. Um, you know, it takes a few hours to get to the. There's a lesser Barry, chance of getting busted for smoking contraband substances <laughs> of a only mildly illegal nature. Well, isn't isn't it legal now in Maryland? In um, in uh, uh, isn't it legal now in Washington? Well, that doesn't make it fun. 
Say, oh, it's legal now. Oh, yeah. Okay, I guess I'll smoke <laughs> up. No, no, you come here and say, oh, yeah, man, it's illegal here. Oh, boy. Okay. Well, personally, that, that doesn't necessarily enter into my equation, but I, I'm sure for some it enters people into it does. Some. Um, and that's fine. Uh, it's thrill yeah. of doing what you shouldn't. Oh, my. <laughs> that's that's probably a topic for another I mean, episode. that's why they have that Fifty Shades of Grey thing, right? It's doing what you shouldn't. Ooh. Yeah, like doing, like writing badly. <laughs> well, I wasn't gonna say that one, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Using the wrong adverb, <laughs> using too many, <laughs> uh, not completing your sentences when you should, and effectively just changing names from you know like uh, you know, flash fiction, and then writing it as your own. Yeah. But whatever, I mean, the guy, guy or gal, whoever wrote it, it's got a lot of success off for them for that. So uh, you know, I won't begrudge him on that one. Uh, yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, if you want to, uh, listeners, if you want to get a, a, in contact with us, you can always email us at uh, uh, the simulationist at gmail dot com, and uh, you can send us uh, your thoughts on uh, places that you would like to meet up in Victoria or whatever. <laughs> Um, events and goings on happening around here. There's a lot, and we're just two guys with yeah. you know, with jobs and lives. So I mean, we gotta we we do what we can, but there's always so much going on. Yeah. Oh, NPC Con. Uh, NPC Con. NPC Con. So two C's, not MP Con. I, yeah, I think NPC there's a second on? C in okay. there. Probably. In Prince George is happening in, in October, so oh, yeah. look forward to that. Um, I think it's a v- much smaller convention than what we, even what we have here in uh, Victoria, but they are they are growing, and so there's that's something to watch out for. And, you know, they, they do have both a college and university up there, so, you know, like, you expect a somewhat better uh, turnout than what you might expect for a place, uh, you know, off of that uh, 97% of Canada within so many kilometers of the U.S. border. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Yep. I, and I went there a couple years. The, the people that I um, made friends with, uh, are, they are very good friend, people, still friends of mine. And, uh, and Thank yeah. you, Facebook. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, because it lets you keep in touch with them. Um, yeah, uh, what else? Uh, that's enough for now, I, yeah. for the f- shout-outs and stuff. Okay, so <laughs> I think we had a main topic at um, some point. Well, a bit of a review as well. Oh, right, as part of what, we were, what we've what we been up to, we watched the we just watched the Lego movie again. Uh, well, I watched it again. This would be your first uh, view. I hadn't seen, yeah, I hadn't seen it before today, the, the Lego movie. I had had, uh, like, a lot of people say, oh, this is a great movie, I want to watch it again and again. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, my daughter has wanted to watch it over and over again. Uh, not, like, back-to-back sort of thing, but, you know, she'll find the... Uh, the, the case for it. Oh, Lego Movie, watch. Lego Movie, watch. So, uh, like, maybe she just likes the music. Maybe she actually likes the story, likes the characters, how they, they you know, how they look and all that. But it does have a good replay value for her. I, I don't mind it replaying. Mm-hmm. Um, it wasn't, I, I think, terribly original, uh, as, as movies go. Well, this sh- sure, the storyline wasn't that original. It was, it was your standard hero's journey and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. Um, the hero just happens to be a Lego figure. Yeah, sure. Um, it had Batman, but whether or not you could consider him to be the real Batman or just, you know, like a Lego Batman with, like, a, his own world and life of, you know... Well, that's up to for you to decide, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I gotta say, though, what they did, they did very well. Just because it's not new doesn't mean it's not good. Um... The death of the mentor sort of thing, you know, like, ah, oh, no, he struck down, you know, like, Obi-Wan, no! Mm-hmm. Uh, in which case, yeah, the mentor's loss, it did resonate, because he was kind of an awesome guy. Not just because he was voiced by Morgan Freeman, but he was, you know, generally a decently awesome guy, all-around good person. The mentor's loss resonated even though, spoiler alert, uh, his head keeps on just talking to the guys after he... That's, no. Well, they have to remember to breathe. That's just like the first thing. So, oh, things to do. Like, oh, don't forget to breathe. It's like, ah, oh, I'm so on top of that. So apparently, yeah, oxygen is not a big uh, factor for hmm. for Lego people. Uh, and, and, I mean, there was that story of Metalbeard the pirate. And he escapes with his head and, and organs. Um, mm-hmm. 
So, like, like, yeah, him jumping around with just his head seems to indicate that they, they clearly do not have the, oh, head is, you know, gone, you die quickly sort of problem that we do. They've transcended that by virtue of not needing blood. So, uh, but, uh, like, his loss did resonate. You could see the, you know, like, oh, no, like, everyone felt it, you know, and it's not just like, okay, he was important, now he's gone. Oh, no, no, it's like the people felt sorry for his loss when they saw him go. And I like that. Yeah, the Lego characters. That this is something notable about this movie, is that they. Well, I guess it's partly just voice acting, but these Lego characters with very limited range of motion. Actually, like they only <laughs> technically have two fingers because they're picture <laughs> hands, right? You know. Yeah, the people who made the movie. I don't know if you call them puppeteers. I guess the CG artists, animators? Or whatever the animators. Yeah, sure. That's the, that's the word. And I, I think that that qualifies for everything <laughs> yeah. that they were doing. Um, they did a good job of make, of making these Lego figures emote, and you know, I guess people have been doing that for well, however long with animation the, already. But not a lot of body motion in that. With Gumby, you could have him go all sorts of areas because he's totally made out of like you know like that. But to, like, there's very little movement you can do with a Lego person's body. Mm-hmm. So. They, I mean, they had extra leeway for the hands and the motion for how the hands go, but the body was, by and large, a Lego person's body. Yeah, and the faces were just picked, like, might as well be animated because the faces, like the mouth, just talked. The same thing that you can uh, effectively find on the uh, Monty Python, uh, you know, like a Camelot song as done in Lego. It was, it was not that mm-hmm. far off from there. Yeah. Um Let's see, I, I think, though, I what I really like best about it is that it reflects my views on, on stuff like, uh, well, for instance, uh, the whole prophecy. There will be someone who will come along and they will, you know, uh, they will meet, like, the, uh, it's a MacGuffin. A MacGuffin that will stop the bad guy. Let's just be, let's just be, you know, out and clear on that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And uh, they will be amazing and awesome and all that sort of thing. And, uh... Yeah, like, I'm usually not that big on prophecies and stories. Mm-hmm. Because it effectively gives you, like, invulnerability. Like, I'm the chosen one. You can't kill me. Why? Because I'm the chosen one. I mean, I just said that. Weren't you listening? Mm-hmm. Um, whereas how they have things set up, it's, it's more open-ended. Like, uh, you meet these conditions, and this is you. You become the chosen one. And that's what I like. Oh, yeah. uh, whereas not, like, you have to do this because the prophecy says so, the prophecy says you're this because you met the conditions. Um, and I, I do, I like that so much more because I, I keep watching movies where, you know, it's like a, a situation where like you have to do it because, you know, it's like in your blood and, you know, like I like the Lord of the Rings but the whole the concept of the blood of man is failing. They are weak. Why is Aragorn not considered good enough to do it? Because his forebearers were not good enough to do it. And it's like, dude, like your worthiness is not a genetic factor. Worthiness is a personal characteristic. Mm-hmm. So you know everybody, you know, should be equally, you know, like by you know just random assortment, have a proper chance at being good enough to you know like be the ring bearer and not succumb to it. And everybody should have equal chances of like failing to that, judging on the power of the ring. Yeah. It should be like, oh, you are a human, and humans have failed in the past. Therefore, no human can ever be trusted with this sort of thing. <laughs> and I, I like Tolkien, but I didn't like the whole, like, your worthiness is a blood trait. Well, didn't, I mean, he did subvert that in the character of Sam, because Sam was probably the lowest, most common hobbit you could get. And he ended up being the guy who finally did the, the ring deed. Right? He, well, you know, he was the one that, that didn't falter. Like, uh, yeah. Boromir had his moment. Ah, you should give it to me. I need it to protect my nation. Ah. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> and, you know, and, you know, and then, oh, I guess it's got to be a heroic sacrifice for me. But everyone had the time. Te- Galadriel was tempted at grabbing the ring. Mm-hmm. Gandalf was tempted at that. Sam, uh, same way with Gamgee, never gave a damn about the ring. He gave a damn about his friends, and he well, gave he, a damn about going back home again. He almost, he actively, like, he despised the ring, because he saw it it hurting his master, or his, his friend. His He saw it, like, weighing down on Frodo, and that's why he hated it so much. And uh, he had that wonderful clarity of vision to see what it actually does, and yeah. because of that, he never even had to, like, make a saving throw to see whether or not he is tempted by it. It's like, no, dude, I think 
look, that's saying it's a horrible thing. I want a gun. I want to throw it into the Mountain Doom. Definitely, that's my goal right now. And mm-hmm. then go back home and you know trim the verge again. Bah, back to being a farmer. Mm-hmm. Sort of thing. Uh, I know, or also, I guess you know, just, you know, general and garden tender and all that sort of thing. He had a couple rules he did, but he was, he was generally just a, a basic gardener. Uh, that's what they called him, the gardener. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. It was such a small town. I I, I can't believe <laughs> everybody <laughs> had just one role. He probably did a couple other things. Yeah, yeah. Um, He's probably a handyman too. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I can definitely see him doing general <laughs> handiwork and fixing up tools and whatnot. But uh, yeah, I, that, that was the one thing I really did like is Sam. You know, like he. he no, I mean, I'm not tempted. I don't care. I don't like that darn ring. It's caused nothing but trouble. He's the guy who had the common sense. That was his superpower. He had common sense to see what was going on. Mm-hmm. Gandalf has to check for it. You know, Galadriel. Oh my goodness, I could have the ring and be a queen. Everyone loves and despairs. Ha <laughs> ha. Uh, but no, no, no. He's just like, oh, let's get rid of this ring now. It's like you know. <laughs> Take the manure out to the manure pile. Got to yeah. compost it. But I suppose I mean Sam is sort of the exception as far as main characters go. He's the uh, yeah, he's definitely most, the exception. Most of Tolkien's main characters are like these, you know, powerful, um, destined to be rulers, and generally turn out to be relatively good, except for the villains, of course. But generally turn out to be kind and wise and just, like Aragorn. Um, you know, he has to learn a few lessons in, in the way, but yeah. And he has to learn to set aside his fears, sort of thing. He didn't, he mm-hmm. didn't want that, that, Nars, was it Narsil? Yeah, Narsil, the, the broken sword. He didn't want it because he was afraid, you know, of its legacy and all that. Yeah. The last person well, who wielded it, you know, was, although I will note in the books, uh, yeah, he did effectively wield the broken blade until it got repaired. Yeah, he was a bit less reluctant. In the book, he's. I think there's still a little bit of reluctance in the books, but in the, the films, the crown would weigh heavily upon his head until he could overcome his fear. Yeah, but the films give him a make him a little bit more um, unsure of himself than yeah than Tolkien's. Well, I version. mean, given how badly his ancestor botched what could have been guess, a wonderful yeah. history, <laughs> uh, I can see that. Yeah. But no, it, it, like. Uh, even Tolkien fell down to to the whole precept of uh, worthiness being a genetic thing, mm-hmm. as opposed to worthiness being something you learn to do. You know, it's like, oh, in order to be a great person, you know, like, you're not born with it. You know, it's like, oh, yeah, you, you learn the lessons of it, and thus you overcome and become a better person for it. Hey, now you're considered to be, like, the chosen one. Mm-hmm. The chosen one just effectively being, like, uh, I guess, like, congratulations, you're now a high-level character. Um, is I guess an interesting yeah. way of thinking about it. I wonder if that's just an artifact of of storytelling, just because I, I think mean, it is a bit of an old artifact sort of thing. Yeah, because we tell stories about you know singular individuals who do heroic things, sort of on their own, but at the same time, I mean, yes, they're supported by you know various support characters, but sort of we look at that one character as you know they the one who did it. Um, uh, yeah, the boy who survived. Um, as opposed to sort of maybe a more realistic version is that, well, you know, there's a community around them and, and there's also sort of external forces pushing them in this and that direction. And, and yes, they were, were, were happy that, you know, so-and-so took up the burden, but, you know, it could have been his brother, it could have been someone else. Um, yeah, I don't know. There is another. <laughs> yeah, there is another. Uh, but yeah, because yeah, we have that storytelling where we we need a strong figure to identify with a, a singular. But not character. a perfect figure, someone with flaws. Oh so yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. You can't recognize that. You know, hey, I could be this person too. Yeah. But it, it just seems like in a world where you know, like especially like America's like, oh, democracy. Every nation must be democracy. Democracy is awesome. And yet Hollywood's pumping out story after story where it's like, ah, I am born the chosen one. It's not something you can just be. Anyone can be. I was born by the fate of destiny to be this chosen person. And it's like, n- like that's not exactly a lesson you really want to be teaching the general populace. You kind of want them to strive to become better. Like anybody can be great. You can be the next, you know, Henry Ford. You know, like, I was born to be, like, the next Henry Ford. Like, we some sort of Midland farmer. I don't care about you at all. You you will mm-hmm. never achieve greatness. And I, I, I find that very disheartening for American cinema. And so that's why I'm happy that they didn't go down that route for the uh, the Lego movie. Right. Now, I think there might be something... You might still be able to get something out of that the chosen narrative in that almost like any of us can sort of 
imagine like how would I respond if it turned out that for some you know I was a lost you know long lost heir of some long king Ralph. kingdom <laughs> yeah well yeah sort of that King Ralph story um, and uh, and I I think in a way there's something that appeals to us is like we can say oh what if I was chosen sort of and we can put ourselves in that in those shoes and see the story as like sort because of, we're all we're all the center of our own universe. We yeah. should be. There are some people <laughs> I mean, who are pretty certain that have some low self-esteem <laughs> that see themselves as a secondary character in someone else's story. Well, which is a little I, sad. You I guys, can, you guys could be your own protagonist. Don't worry. I was going to go a little bit the other way and and say um, I don't know if it's always people don't always consider it a good thing that you're the center of your own universe because people like people who aren't quite so selfish. Um, but it sort of, in a this way... This is my story. There are many like it, but it is my <laughs> own. Yeah, yeah. So we, we're all, in a way, we're all our own chosen person for our own destiny. Um, so uh, That's it. I do prefer the concept of I chose myself for this. I, I know what I was getting mm-hmm. into, so I, I nominate myself. I chose me to yeah. do, take up this thing, which is why I respect Frodo so much, is he chose to bear the ring. He saw, like, oh, geez, everyone's fighting over it. You know, it's a guy. You know, like uh, he's like I. I don't want them all fighting about it. I've carried it this far. I'll keep on carrying it. I will bear the ring. He did say that. He said those words. I don't think he perse- He saw himself saw as choosing. I think he he did not see any other alternative. He he didn't but feel like he had I a choice. But that's I think maybe even the best of it. It's like he looks around and says, "Well, this can't be. No one else can, can you know, like, can can really take it up. And this needs to be done. I kind of have to make certain this gets done. I will mm-hmm. take it up myself. Yeah, but I suppose yeah, from other Which characters' is an attitude, point of I view, think a, a lot of the best people in the world will have is like there are things in this world that need to get done. If they're gonna get done to my satisfaction, it's gonna have to be me doing it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so I do like that it kind of teaches you know the, the sort of lesson of of, uh, of choose yourself rather than have fate decide that you must be the one who does it. So that, that's a good lesson. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other lesson I like in there is, is the concept of teamwork. Um, they have these master builders in the movie, and each of them is capable of building amazing things. But they don't work well together. It's like a bunch of people playing with Lego. Uh, you know, like, I'm building this, and I'm building that, and in the end we'll all put our stuff together. You, you wind up with, you know, like a hodgepodge. It doesn't have any real smooth sense of flow unless you've got a lot of communication going between each other. Yeah. That's one thing I know probably three or four scenes maybe more that I missed, but there was times in the in the sh- the Lego movie where they really they captured that feeling of what it feels like to play with Lego when they say something like, "Oh, hand me that uh I need two a 1 or, by 2 or, need a, yeah, 1 by 2 or yeah. hand me that thing or or oh, can can anybody find this this wheel or I need a hinge yeah. piece going on here. Can it be a gray color too? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, we got that yeah. going up there. And they each have their own style. Like Batman only builds with black blocks or very dark shades <laughs> of gray. <laughs> Uh, whereas Una Kitty's working with pastels and fancy colors and making stuff with flowers and rainbows. Mm-hmm. And you know, don't get me wrong, none of their design styles was bad. Um, very idiosyncratic. In this case, I found it uh, is an interesting way of showing the difference for like a, a lawful good versus a chaotic good group. Okay. I, um, right. <laughs> chaotic good, everyone's doing their own thing independently. That would be like uh, in many adventuring groups when you see a bunch of people going into a fight, but it's not really a team going into a fight. It's four people, each of which, you know, like, effectively doing their own thing. Mm -hmm. If there's anybody doing, like, some helping out for anyone else, it's going to be, like, the wizard in the back doing the buff spells. Uh, By and large, though, like, a lot of adventuring groups I I see on the table, it's, like, four independent people just fighting for the same cause all at once. As opposed to the lawful sort of thing where it's like, okay, we've got a plan, we do this, we make it go like this. It's not your style, but it will succeed. And that's kind of awesome in itself, right? Hmm. And, and so, uh, I mean, consider this. If you are a flamboyant, unique individual, you are not going to hide from the guards when you're sneaking into like the uh, the evil tyrant's capital city. You want to look like everybody else. You want to blend in. You, you got to work with the oh, yeah. theme. Sure. Yeah. In which case, you know, like being a flamboyant, unique self sort of thing. You're 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 not gonna, you know, you're not gonna match the theme and the flow of everyone else. And uh, 
that causes pains. And, and so it just well, you that, could suppress that. Which, you know, like they manage to do is that they follow the plan. And they get good success off of the plan, as well as good as can be expected, I suppose, right? Mm-hmm. And, and that's a nice lesson I like to see. That, uh, you know, it's, it's not about the hero. Ah, the hero saves the day because the hero's the hero. The hero saves the day because everyone's working together. And they're working, you know, as, as a unified thing. Although, I, I will admit, towards the later end, it's like, oh boy, you know, like, time to, to assert your unique self and, and build it your own way. So, then do this, you know, turn your turn your cement mixer into a flying, you know, machine. That, in, in which case, I don't see as being against that lesson. That's just, you know, like, Lego is awesome and you can make anything out of it. And that's a, a separate lesson to learn. Although, I can see people confusing the two. Uh, did do you notice that sort of theme in there? Theme in there, or was that just something I picked out because of my own personal narrative? Well, I I saw it happen. I don't know if I I perceived it as necessarily like a major theme in the show. I mean, I definitely noticed that. Yeah, there was different characters who had different styles, um, hmm. and yeah, I, I don't know. Like, it's one of these movies. It's similar to The Hobbit in that it's just the action just happens. And it, it's cool and it's fun. I enjoyed watching, you know, cars crash into each other and jumping over a freeway. But I didn't get the sense that oh, teamwork is absolutely necessary. Otherwise, this plan wouldn't have worked because they don't really adhere to any sort of reality about the plan. It's just oh, you know, uh, we did this thing and and somehow magically we fell in the right way and and it worked. It all worked out. So there's no. I didn't feel. And this is the problem with some recent. You know, well, I guess a, a lot of action movies is that you you get so much action and so much improb- unbelievable stuff happening that it's like, well, whatever. I mean, I don't. Yes, okay, fun, fun action. I liked it, but I, I didn't ever fear that the good guy was gonna, you know, crash. You didn't fear and, that, like when like the the two dozen skelebots are shooting lasers, that the person's actually just gonna get clipped and fall down all of a sudden. I mean. I may have made a comment, a snarky comment at the screen at one of those points saying, like, those guys are terrible shots because there's, like, thousands of bullets coming in at them and not one hit. Um, That's definitely <laughs> plot armor there. I won't lie on that. Um, yeah. So when it when it actually came down to, like, okay, what makes them succeed, the thing that I feel made them succeed was, well, the writers just waved their hands and said, they're heroes, so they succeed. So I, I don't know if I found the teamwork storyline that compelling, necessarily. Mm. But I think that's a common problem in... I mean, I saw that in Star Trek. I saw that in The Star Hobbit. Star Wars. A lot of in time. Star I mean, Wars. I mean, there's that whole joke about stormtroopers never hitting anything. <laughs> yeah. So it's... Yeah, it's that's not a new criticism, but it's hard, yeah. It is a recurring uh, <laughs> failure of the heavily visual genre. Yeah, uh, Transformers comes to mind. The Avengers a little bit like that too. Um, Although the Avengers, I mean, did have a, that, that one scene where it goes from one person to another as they're all fighting the alien, uh, you know, invasion. In which case, their various styles are being used. Well, I mean, you know, like, uh, I guess spoiler alert. Captain sure. America <laughs> effectively narrates what everyone should be doing and where they should be. Oh, so he yes, utilizes yeah. everybody's personal style. He's the captain. He's the commander or the... Well, he does yeah. have military experience. Yeah. But he utilizes everybody's talents and uh, styles uh, in order to their best advantage so they get maximum use without any, you know, like, uh, you know, like oh, how dare you, I was doing this, you hit my guy and all that. Actually, yeah, I, I can say I enjoyed that. Um I I enjoyed that uh, idea because I I don't remember seeing necessarily that way of doing it before. So yeah. Uh, well, I mean, let's let's face it. When you're doing something with superheroes, you got to get some good screen time for it. Look at how awesome I am! I am I'm putting the super and superhero. Just watch me. And then they had the whole thing where it's like, uh, well, it's CG, but you know, it's like one person to another, and it's just one continuous flow of all the people being awesome all together. Mm-hmm. Um. And then in the end, you know, like the Hulk punches Thor. Dun, dun, dun. That's kind of like you know, like a nice little rim shot at the end, right? Yeah, yeah. And it's it's a reminder when you get that. Re- and we had a lot of this in, in the Lego Movie, in that it is. I mean, they get some really fun action going on, but in the end, it is just jokes, and it's just you know, oh, they're they're still Lego pieces, and you know, a Lego might, guy might fall apart, or you know, there'll be some little joke to remind us, yeah, we're not actually serious about all this action, but hey, here's a thing that happens. Well, that is what I liked about it. It had did have a, a very nice uh, mixed ratio of humorous stuff to serious stuff and little background things in there. 
Yeah. Like well, how? I mean, yeah, imagine like for a Lego mo- for a movie about a toy that's you know building blocks, it was very serious. <laughs> But uh, yeah. <laughs> well, it's the thing is, is it what some of the stuff tr- you know worked as versus like the Lego reality versus the real reality of it. Like they had the think tank where all the people were locked up and all that. And then if you look mm. in the background in the real world, you've got all the figures up on the wall on oh, display. Oh, I missed that. Well, that's kind of neat. Yeah. It, uh, it does give it a very good replay value that way. Is uh, you'll watch it again, and you'll see those little things you didn't catch the first time. Um. Like I, I tell you, like uh, you caught on the first time, uh, the, the mystical guy's staff was actually just a uh, a, a sucker that had been yeah. broken in, in a fun shape and all that, and I didn't catch that till my second viewing. And I just okay, yeah, whatever. He's got a funky staff, and then you know, looking at the second, time, I was like, wait, yeah, I remember doing that with some of those things myself when I was you know, <laughs> they you know, just keep it in the wrapper because you don't want to get the sticky stuff all over that. <laughs> And I'm I'm curious now too because it it fit very nicely in his hand and in, in the movie. And From I'm my perspective, uh, the stuff that you, yeah you, you get you know like at Halloween and all that those those sucker candies do work. They, 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 they in fit very nicely, nicely with the Lego man. <laughs> Not 100 percent perfect, but they fit, and you don't have to worry about breaking like a half his hand off. So there you go. Mm-hmm. Well, that's okay because if you ever break off one hand on on like the Lego man's like claw hands, it winds up becoming like a hook, and then you got a pirate. So hooray! Yep. Yep, or you can get the pirates, like pirate Lego with actual hooks for hands. Yeah, hey, I'm, I'm back from the classical stuff where Lego was really expensive because I was young and I didn't have a job, uh-huh. and you had to make do with what you had. And if something broke, you better find a way to make it useful again. Hmm. Okay. So you know, like, yeah, yeah. You learn, you use your imagination that way. Um, but in the end, it told the good story. Uh, what I think uh, I noted most about uh, what I liked was that the heroic uh, sacrifice and rebirth. Okay. Which they've done a lot of times, sort of thing. Um, Gandalf the Grey fights, you know, like uh, the Balrog, dies, comes back Gandalf the White. Neo dies fighting Agent, uh, you know, Smith, comes back as the One. Uh, in this case, uh, Emmett, I, I don't think you can cons- really consider it done. He definitely sacrificed himself. Yeah, he jumped into the void, which is... <laughs> I don't understand. It's some kind of portal between the Lego universe and the real universe. It's just their perception of what the edge of the table is. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, he jumped off the table. He fell off the edge of the table in that case. Ah! It's just like, I'm, I'm, I'm out of the known universe altogether. Ah! Mm-hmm. Um, and so in which case, yeah, he makes the heroic sacrifice air quotes, dies, and he later comes back, you know, as, as like a chosen one. He can see the parts, which, by the way, yeah, they actually do show the reference number. So if you ever want that one piece, pause the movie, write down the number, <laughs> and do your proper order form at the LEGO website. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, I, I was kind of... I don't know how they know the part numbers. I don't know where that ever comes in, but that's a bit of an outside joke, I suppose. But, uh... I, I did like how they did it in that case. Um, as I said before, nothing new, but still very well done as they did it. Yeah. So, well, was he in? Some, I guess he was in some kind of afterlife, or the you know, where he, he, he goes in the real world, some sort of greater area of the universe. Yeah, and he he sees the the people who play with the Legos. Yes. Yes. Yeah. The man upstairs and yeah. his son. I mean, the the plot, the whole plot doesn't make a lot of sense because, well, obviously, Legos are don't move around on their own. There's no Lego universe, but uh, no. But um, it's the world of the imagination that's doing it, and that's what yeah. it's all about. Is is Lego is your imagination, and don't just you know like make your thing as a display and then just let it sit on the shelf. Play with it, remake it, redo it. I mean, the the instruction books are there. You don't have to follow them. That's the 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 lesson that they try and teach you is definitely a chaotic good lesson. Mm-hmm. Is uh you know like like don't be you know like a dick and just you know like have fun and fall through and let other people play with your stuff. Definitely a chaotic good sort of message. Yeah, and and um there was sort of an anti like because this is a thing that people really do in real life is they will after they've made a great Lego creation they'll super glue it together. I will admit to having had the concept like I don't ever want this to be anything else. I how can I preserve this forever? Yeah. In which case it was just hide it from my brothers. Yeah. Yeah. The super glue thing never really hit my head, and probably for a good thing. 
Yeah, and then the movie seems a little bit anti super glue, or at least don't super glue. Well, yeah, it's basically anti super glue. Well, there was some good benefits to it, like uh, like uh-huh. even you know Lego Superman couldn't you know like uh, you know like uh, destroy some of their stuff. Why? Because it had been craggled together. So in which case you you could make an argument that uh, oh crazy glue right not yeah, super glue crazy crazy glue craggle some of the letters erased off that. But uh, what you could do with it is is uh, make the argument that uh, some some of the base things you can have super glued up. Definitely, if you're working on a larger set thing, get your base you know terrain thing, glue that to <laughs> your, like your particle board stuff, so mm-hmm. that you've got them all together and nicely aligned, so everything works up just right that way. Um, but don't don't glue everything. Don't glue your stuff together. You know, like don't burn your bridge sort of thing, right? Um, I guess it's a bit of a personal call. I do recall making sketches of my own stuff. Like I, I remember taking Lego with a lot of the uh, the joint pieces and making like a Terminator hand out of red and black Lego, and it was oh, yeah. it was cool. like life size and it had a, not perfect joint articulation, but I was able to get like a like a rotating piece for the thumb so you could have it grip in opposable and work it along with everything else. Mm-hmm. And uh, you had to move every piece. It's not like I had like little wires to work with it, but it was life size and it was like if I do say so myself, maybe the best thing I ever made out of Lego because it it looked like Lego Terminator and it went right all the way down to just above the uh, where the elbow would be. And mm-hmm. it's like, oh, my brother's going to want this, so I had to start making notes as to what piece goes where. Mm. And so I wound up doing some design schematics so I could remake it if need mm-hmm. be. I never was able to get all the pieces back together. Thank you, brothers. Crazy Lego sloppy ways. Yeah. And the bagged vacuum, so once it gets vacuumed up, it's gone forever. I am surprised they didn't actually have that as a, a, like a horrible outer world menace. It's just like a vacuum. Oh yeah, yeah. That would Lord knows a lot yeah. of Legos being lost to a vacuum cleaner. Yeah. Ah, well, maybe in a sequel. Eh? I mean, yeah. There's there's so many ideas. I mean, once you open up the world of Lego as a storytelling medium, yeah. I mean, you could make you know cartoons and movies and yeah. There's well, lots definitely of a lot of video games based off of this. Yeah, there's already yeah several. Um, yeah. From Indiana Jones to to you know like uh, I mean I think the Batman's got its third one going on. You could play as a, a Lego Kevin Smith. They have Kevin Kevin Smith in Lego. Yeah, and the latest uh, Batman Adventure one is basically Brainiac attacks, and all the heroes have to go in. So, like, depending on how many points you wind up getting, you can get unlock extra characters. So you can play instead of Batman as someone else, and apparently one of them is Kevin Smith. <laughs> um, not Silent Bob sort of thing. So you don't get the trench coat and all that sort of thing. Um, and it's Kevin not like Smith, you get like a big Oilers jersey. Kinda, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, but that's the thing, though, is that because it's the same body as everyone else, he's the same size as Wonder Woman and Superman and Batman and everyone else there. So it's yeah. like, I mean, I know he makes a lot of jokes referencing his size, but, you know, he, Lego Kevin Smith is the same size as every other Lego person. Mm-hmm. Hooray. So that's kind of groovy. Um, so yeah, you can have a lot of fun and bring in a lot of outside references that way. I do like it as as a movie medium. I hope to see it again in the future. And you know what? Uh, I mean, this, it does wet my whistle. I, I might want to go and see what I can find about about some of the uh, the cartoon stuff they've done for the various stuff. Uh, oh, what was it? I remember seeing uh, just a few episodes of something like Legend of Chima and uh, like Ninjago. Where I think they they kept the same sort of uh, like um, loose funny style to it, but I'll have to watch more to find out. But now that I've seen the Lego Movie, maybe I'll, I'll think a little bit more seriously about finding it when it's on. So oh boy, I'll give it a shot. In which case, congratulations, they've succeeded at doing some interesting cross promotion. Mm-hmm. So hooray! Well, I, I mean, I think in big part that's the the Lego Movie is is very like it's how to do your commercial sellouts the right way basically like because it is a big commercial for a toy and yeah, yet we a all very love it. intricate interlocking construction piece <laughs> uh, yeah sure yeah it's not just a toy man it's infinity in block uh-huh, form okay all right fine yeah um, um yeah so in the end what do you give it for a rating uh i think i give it uh, eight out of thirteen dwarves, maybe nine, nine out of thirteen dwarves. Ah. So, what were the downsides of the whole thing that you found really kept you from giving the full dwarf? 
Um, well, I, well, maybe, I mean, for what it is, I suppose it, su- it succeeds because it, it never tries to be, and that's endearing, of course, it never tries to be more than just, you know, this is what a kid, this is a kid playing with Lego telling a silly story. This is what Batman would be if a so, kid was portraying. And yeah, that's, that's the thing, like, none of the characters, I mean, they're interesting, they're not necessarily believable, but they don't have to be, so, I, I mean, it doesn't. It succeeds at everything it tries to do, but it doesn't try to do that much. So, I mean, I definitely... It's of just course, a fun little story. Sir. Yeah. yeah. Um, Not everything has to be <laughs> Oscar gold, buddy. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, I give it nine dwarves out of 13, and, and I enjoyed it, and I don't think I'll watch it again, but if there's a sequel, I'll probably watch that. I know I'll be watching it again, whether I want to or not. <laughs> yeah, true. With, if you have kids, there, yeah, that's going to make a big difference. But that's okay, because I, I want to get my daughter's appetite for Lego, you know, really, really, I want her thirsty for Lego, yeah. so that when she's old enough, I can play Lego with her for hours, and neither of us will get tired. Yeah, and, and that's, I guess we didn't really talk about that theme, but there is a father-son theme in the in the movie. And I was I was actually kind of a little bit, like, the kid doesn't do Lego with his peers. His mm. sister makes a very short appearance at the very end. But other than that, the whole Lego dynamic is just between the father and son. And that's the only real-world relationship we see. Although, to be fair, I mean, it was the father's Lego. So, you know, like the kid mm-hmm. probably, you know, was taking a big enough risk playing with it himself, let alone bringing his friends in to play with. Yeah. And, I mean, like, that kid is, is well... I was going to say he's lucky, but, I mean, his dad is kind of like, eh, I don't his know. His dad's able to learn lessons, so <laughs> yeah, I consider true. him a pretty darn lucky kid. Um, but, yeah, his dad has this huge collection of Lego that... <laughs> You're not <laughs> supposed to play with. Or my display stuff only. Yeah, but, I mean, I guess, I mean, some dads have big collections of Lego, but, yeah, not every. I know I'm can. going to have to give a stern warning to my daughter when she starts pulling my books out. You know, yeah. Like, no, 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 these are daddy's books. Treat them with care. Flip every page properly. <laughs> you can read them all, but you got to treat them with respect. Because uh, I don't want her accidentally ripping or bending or folding the pages of my various, uh, you know, books. Uh, I want them to be around for a very long time, and I don't want to have to play forty bucks for a new one. Because um, you know, one part cheap, one part uh, thinking long term. And did you feel like like the dad in the show, who's who's Will Ferrell? Will Ferrell, yes. Um, do you feel like? Did he, before the son sort of came down there and, like, he had a moment of epiphany. He's like, oh, you know, I need to change. Or, you know, so that's... I'm being really quite like, selfish. With I'm being Lego. selfish with my Lego. Now, do you think that that guy, like, that character didn't know, that, didn't believe that or know that at the beginning of the... Like, I think before? that's a lesson everybody has to learn with Lego. That's a lesson I had to learn. No, 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 listen... If, even if you bought it with yourself, you got to share your Lego with your brothers. <laughs> you, I don't care if you pay it with your own money. Yeah, Lego's meant to be shared. And you kinda, sometimes you have to force it, but it's a good lesson to learn. Lego's not just for you unless you're the only one there. But if, you, if you've ever played Lego with kids, I, older than, than your daughter, although she might have, have displayed this too, but kids... Um, they build something out of Lego, and then they get very protective of it, of course. Oh, I'm, I am taking a change of that. My daughter's got uh, Mega Blocks, which is basically giant young kid Lego. Mm-hmm. And uh, I am teaching her uh, both the lesson of knocking stuff over, as well as the lesson of time to clean up and put it away. In which case, we disassemble the Mega Blocks. Mm-hmm. So uh, I definitely am going to, to make a concentrated effort, conscious concentrated effort, that she learns the lesson of it's not forever, it's for play, and, and you don't necessarily... Because, I mean, I remember stacking like uh, those like uh, letter blocks with her, and after a certain point, when one tower falls over, she knocks all of them over. We all start fresh at the same time, sort of thing. Well, I want to ask... Turn like, it into a small game, sort of thing. I, I think we're taking for granted that that's a good thing, but I want to like take a second to, to ask, and I'm probably wrong about this, oh, okay, okay. but um, if it isn't... An, a bad way because modernism and and I'm I guess I'm turning into a communist when I say this but we have our modern society where we have to let things go and we have to you know, when you make something you know somebody else takes it away like if you worked in a factory or something like that you work all day really Look hard to make all these things I've made they you know fantastic thing taken away. and then shoo, 
on to the next one and then make another one and then whew, that's gone and you yes you can have pride in it but it's like you know it's you're an assembly line you're moving things on and and does lego teach us sort of and may, i don't know if this might actually be a good value like being able to let things go that's very buddhist I, yeah well, i was about to mention it's <laughs> quite a big thing you have to learn that uh nothing is permanent um, and the more times you learn that lesson, the better off you are when something goes away. But it also seems very cruel and very, um, uh, very like uh, capitalist to say, no, y- yeah, you made that, but you don't get to keep it. Like, yes, you you put some of yourself into it, but now it has to it has to go away. It has to or be disassembled if it's Lego, or has to be taken away, rather than being able to sort of construct your environment and sort of like, oh, I built this, you know. Imagine the like city on rock and roll. <laughs> imagine like building, filling your house with sculptures and stuff. I guess that's a, basically a hoarder. Yeah. Um, but I mean, if if you had you know lots of money or whatever, if you were very rich, you could have a big space and just and fill the space with whatever you wanted, whatever you created and crafted, and keep those things. So I don't know. That that's neither here nor there. I don't. I don't know if I have a conclusion. I don't, do you have any thoughts to add to that part? Uh, well, yeah, and nothing is forever, and you have to learn to let stuff go. That mm-hmm. said, uh, the concept of, of Lego subverts that, that mm-hmm. nothing is permanent, because you can always make it back again. So, like, you can make mm-hmm. your, your, yeah. your Lego stuff, and then once you're done, you know, like, it's not like it goes away forever. It just gets reduced back to the primordial block pile that it came from. Okay. Yeah. So it's just kind of like uh, playing with Silly Putty, um, although in which case you can actually separate the colors out properly and you don't have to worry about it becoming homogenous brown over time. Hey, Lego's one up yeah. then from Plato. I guess or yeah, Plato. And Plato has the same same issue. Well, I guess parents love it because parents are like, okay, you know, we played with it. Except that you get and it in the carpet, something. get it on your clothes, get it in your hair. Well, like, Lego's very neat that way. The worst you have to worry about yeah. is falling underneath the, uh, the couch. But then you sort of tidy it up and and this is like, you know, kids make you know, they make artistic, you know, they they bring home drawings from from kindergarten, and they look terrible. But the parents are super proud of them because you know you can ah. distinguish. Oh, this looks like a human figure, and that the child intended to actually draw a person, and it came out looking like a person. And that's but here's the thing: is is that to a parent, it's not just that one picture that looks good. It's all the pictures that came before, and the gradual improvement of the child's skills. Mm-hmm. And so they don't mm-hmm. necessarily see like, wow, that is a pretty crappy picture of a human face. It's like, ah, you have managed to ascend to this area where you yeah. can draw something yeah. that looks like a face. Like, I'll say this. There have been a few times my daughter saw my little, uh, you know, like a uh, pad of paper, you know, the uh, the graph paper and all that, and a uh, pencil and all that, and she grabs the pencil and she has, Daddy, sit down, and she has me sit down on the couch, uh-huh. and she looks over at me, and she draws a little something, and she goes, I, I, and the whole thing winds up being like, you would need either a very powerful connection to artistic expression or a lot of drugs to see uh, the face out of what my daughter winds up drawing. Mm-hmm. But she's always looking over at daddy. Glasses. Daddy glasses. Nose. Sometimes three noses. She wants to get it right so she'll draw a couple more noses until she figured that nose looks good enough. And then the mouth and all like the chin and all that stuff and all that. And, and um and so with that, it's it's not that you know it looks bad to me. It's that one, she wants to use me as a reference. Oh, I am mm-hmm. the muse for her. I feel so happy. <laughs> yeah. And two is that she wants to draw this particular thing, and I get to see how she's attempting it. And the more I watch her as she goes, the more I can see her progress grow out of that. Now, unfortunately, I have a limited amount of space on my fridge and my walls. <laughs> yeah. Eventually, I'm going to have to decide which uh, stays up and which gets put into... I guess we're going to put it into like a binder and all that for... Or, for yeah, stuff. a scrapbook or something, yeah. Uh, something like that. We'll figure that out when the time comes. But uh, Lego, it, it uh, subverts that because, like, oh, look what we built, you know, like, uh, well, with the Mega Blocks, we'll build, take all the Lego uh, Mega Blocks we have and build them all up together. And it's like, ooh, big tower. She'll go, like, big castle and all that. Or sometimes she'll put some stuff together, you know, and she'll get uh, some of the small one-by-ones and she'll stack a few of them together and she'll go, pirate ship. And I can see, I, if I look at it with, and I just kind of switch off a few, like, a critical, <laughs> like, decision-making stuff as to what yeah. qualifies. It's like, I see a boat there. I see it. I can see Kind the, of a mast? Or? That would be the central <laughs> mast. And the stuff at the bottom there that, that spans, you know, horizontally, that's the ship itself. I see what she's doing. Mm-hmm. Um, 
But yeah, we, we do the wonderful stuff, and then, okay, now it's time to put it down, or we topple it over, we try and pick it up, and it falls apart, because she still doesn't lo- learn about this staggering stuff. I'm going to teach her about that, but she doesn't learn how to stagger to create greater uh, stability amongst the structure as a whole. Mm-hmm. And I'll be happy to teach that to her. That was one of my most profound lessons <laughs> at, at Lego. If I put mm-hmm. them back and forth so that the splits on the thing don't work, I can make something that really stands up, as opposed to something that bends under my thumbs. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, like in the end, uh, she we play a, a game with it, play the game of cleanup and take it apart, yeah, and all that. And so instead of you know it becoming non permanent, it becomes a different game to play, and then we can uh-huh. repeat the cycle forever. Whereas if we were to build it and then just leave it, you know, say, like, oh, I'll just uh, you know clear off a spot on a shelf and we'll put it up there, it's it, we're done. That's not a game anymore. It's just something that sits around and will collect dust. So uh, I think the you know like the the non permanent nature of Lego is ultimately for the best because that allows you to play with it all the more. Yeah, and I guess you don't want to end up like uh, Will Ferrell I, in I the movie. I did that right? sort of stuff. Like I I I play with like we had a lot of Lego. You know, three kids growing up, and yeah. presents add up. You buy it yourself. We got we got ice cream buckets of worth of that stuff still sitting there. I got to make it home so I can steal it. So it'll be all mine and eventually my daughter's. <laughs> um, <laughs> But, yeah, we had a lot, and what I'd do is I, I'd get the sets, and I'd make the set, and I'd follow the instructions, and then I'd leave it be, and they gathered dust. And I'd, like, yeah. oh, but I, I don't want to. I had some like, that did that, too, yeah. And, like, watching it, like, I kind of wish we had that movie when I was younger, so I could have learned the lesson <laughs> of, like, no, you have to take it apart. Try building something else out of it. Mm-hmm. Try and keep the theme. Like, you know, I had, like, sort of like a, a wizard's magical cottage. So it's like, yeah, okay, let's just see what else I can build out of that. Maybe I can put the wizard's cottage on my moon base. Let's have some fun. Let's cross-combine the stuff. Do I want to put them back together again later when I'm done? I'll just follow the instructions, build it. I had fun building the stuff. The inside. And unless I was missing just that one piece and I'm looking forever for that one <laughs> one by two piece I need to... Ah. Oh, yeah. But uh, yeah, you know, if I ever want to segregate them and put them back up again, I just follow the building instructions. So long as I have, and it's a lot easier to get the building instructions now because you can find that stuff online. They will give that out for you. Um, now, another. Sorry, this might go a little bit longer. Yeah, a little bit longer. Um, another thing about Lego, though, too, is if you suddenly have the urge, I want to play with my pirate ship, or or I want to play with my uh, my race car or whatever Lego thing, but oh, it's not assembled. Like, does that? I mean, maybe that never that doesn't occur to a child, or maybe a, that thought sort of flies in one ear and out the other for a child. Because okay, I get a bil- chance to build it. Uh, yeah. Buildings like, oh, it's fine. Say, like, oh, no, if I want to play with my you know, with my race set, I have to assemble it. And like, no, dude. It's like, I get to assemble it. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I think And the parents are happy because, well, that wasted another 45 minutes <laughs> of the kid, and I got a chance to watch one of my programs in peace. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I think it's a win-win for everybody in that case. Yeah, and I, I guess I'm part of... What's going on in my brain too is I'm I'm struggling with this um, uh, the art form of imp- improvisation a little bit too because mm-hmm. improvisation is very um, it's come and go it's very dis- it's called disposable theater by some people mm. it's like you know come up with an idea put it you know in front of people but you don't nis- you don't record it or anything sometimes you record it maybe that more nowadays that performance is the only but one of its type they will never yeah. be exactly the same again yeah you just and, and Lego's <laughs> sort of the same way when you're just having fun and playing with it. Yeah, yeah. So Unless you try to, to do better for yourself. Like I remember getting all the conventional Lego pieces and then trying to build a pyramid. That's the biggest pyramid I can build out of Lego. And eh, it was not bad. We had a good amount of Lego, so I was able to build something decent. But then it'd be like, mm-hmm. next day, it's like, what if I made that a hollow pyramid? And then it's like, oh boy. And then it's like, whoa, look at the size of this pyramid. I can wear it like a freaking hat, man. Look at this. This is huge. <laughs> I'm Devo. All right, Lego mm-hmm. Devo. Uh, and oh, and uh, so yeah, there's something to be said about taking it down to try again in that case to do better. Mm-hmm. Uh, each one is unique, but the more it well, it's like different worlds in Minecraft. Like if you, mm-hmm. I go back to my first one, I'm going to be rather embarrassed at the very primitive nature of what I had built. It was like. Like horrible. I mean, oh look at your town defenses. They, no wonder the zombies were attacking all the darn time. You, you had a horrible stuff, and I'm doing better. And I'm proud to say I'm looking at it. I'm saying definitely, I'm doing better than I was last year because I'm mm-hmm. getting the practice in. 
and my mind is slowly expanding and growing in new ways, even if I'm not consciously trying it. I'm looking at architecture in different ways now. I'm thinking about that stuff differently. Yeah, that's good. And Lego and Minecraft and all that stuff where you just play, it helps. It does help. It's a, it's, it's like mm-hmm. luminosity, but you know, like you don't have to, you know, like uh, do a test on the whole thing. It's yeah. just, hey, I'm gonna play. Woo. Yeah. Well, I like Minecraft because it it automatic. It's an auto save game. Mm. Um, although if you if you fall in love and lose all your stuff, <laughs> yeah, that's exactly the best thing. Problem. Um, but basically, like your the things that you build, your buildings, unless they get hit by a creeper or something like that, are basically permanent until you decide to take them down. And so, or in multiplayer, you get griefed. Or I suppose like your your computer dies or something like that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I got backups on my external hard drive of some of my worlds just in case. Yeah. Um, so so Minecraft sort of has the best of both worlds in that you can just shut down your computer and that world is you know that world is put away. It's not out in the middle of the lo- lo- living room taking up space um, and then you can boot up your computer and instantly have all access to all of the things and if you go in creative mode you have an unlimited amount of it yeah 20 yeah. bucks of lego is never going to get you very much mm-hmm. let us be frank and admit that although i am f- crossing my fingers for a very nice day in the future where 3d printing will allow you to print out lego mm-hmm don't know how well it's going to work for Lego or Creo or any of the other stuff, but um, I'm holding out hope everyone finds a way to make it win for for everybody and everyone gets cheap Lego for plenty. But until then, 20 mm-hmm. bucks Lego ain't going to get you a heck of a lot. But 20 bucks can also get you Minecraft. Yeah. <laughs> and that gets you an infinite number of, well, theoretically infinite number of people. Well, because you can, you can actually buy a Minecraft Lego set, right? Which is, yeah, I, I look I, at that as I like, don't know if it's $20 Whoa. or 40 or whatever. But you get, like, a little square, like, one chunk worth of Minecraft world to play with. And I still <laughs> somewhat regret not picking up the one with the Enderman. Just because I think, like, Lego Enders would have been pretty groovy. Yeah. Well, it's, it's always the future. There's always eBay. Well, that's the thing. Is, is I was looking at it. It's like, well, I'll wait for the sale at Target to go a little higher. And then, oh, no, it's gone. Mm. So, no. Well. I'll have to content myself with 50% off movies this week. Oh, well. Or, well, I suppose if I'm cheap, I could just go to, like, St. Vincent de Paul, and because I have a VCR, just pick up five, you know, videotapes for a buck. So, you know, I, I got off for too. that. Yeah. It'll, it'll, it'll put, be the salve on my burn of not having uh, Lego Minecraft. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think we've gone a bit over time, but uh, yeah, a little bit. we have um, uh, final thoughts on the... Uh, I don't know. Oh, did you ever give your your ten number? Ten dwarves of, okay, uh, ten. out of 13. Okay. Because I uh, I really like that the bad guy wasn't a bad guy. He was just misguided, really. Oh, I, I did like that, yeah. I like I like when that happens in a movie. I, I always find it's best when... Uh, the best way to get rid of your villain is to have them become an ally. Yeah. Um, because the Disney death of them falling to, you know, like the, the infinite depths of whatever the scene is they're in... Uh, it seems empty. And I am, I'm kind of looking forward to a sequel, like where... Uh, what's his name? Uh, Captain uh, Industry? No. Oh, Cap- oh, he he was President Business. President Business, yes. <laughs> not Captain Industry. Although that would be yeah. a good, that'd be another. That's good. his brother's <laughs> name. They get the uncle to come down and help out. He has absolutely no imagination, and that's the horrible thing for him to to have to learn is to figure out what to use for magic. Because he's he's you know a captain of industry. He doesn't have imagination. He just buys and sells products. Whatever, man. Yeah. It's got to come to me pre-done. Do this done. Yeah, that's a lesson to be to be learned in, in the big thing. Um, so yeah, I want to see a sequel in which he's sort of the Scrooge McDuck kind of character, where he's you know he's a hero, but he's also rich. And he's got his and foils, yeah, you know, and all that sort of. Yeah, I can definitely see him pl- uh, taking a good Scrooge McDuck role in, in yeah. the future ones. Um, but yeah, I mean, just the concept of like like how do you get rid of a villain at the end of of the movie, uh, when you're not allowed to have the hero kill them. Yeah, well, they, I mean, they could have. He they could have, like, got, knocked uh, his head off, because they knocked other yeah. characters' heads off. Or the, well, I mean, he could have gotten, like, oh, no, the Craggle thing exploded, and now he's stuck in his own Craggle, preserved forever. <laughs> yeah. He's become, you know, like, uh, he's been hoisted by his own petard. And that's the same sort of thing as, like, falling to your death in, like, a Disney film. Mm, yeah. Well, I guess he could have become a ghost, too, and they would have had, like, this, the, the wizard ghost and the... Uh, 
um, the president, rich guy, business. president business ghost. The business ghost. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, it would be interesting to see them try and fight. Yeah, the ghost fight. <laughs> <laughs> but have we, uh, have we seen that in a movie? Like, did Beetle? I think Beetlejuice might have done like. But have we actually seen like a ghost battle? Like. Battle Royale to, between, uh, uh, like, poltergeists or, like, you know... Did they do that in mm. Casper? I'm not sure. No, Casper wasn't big on fighting. It was all boo and everyone runs away. Yeah. And it really wasn't a scary boo. There must have been something supernatural about the other ghosts' haunting abilities. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm just trying to think about it. And, like, the concept of, of two ethereal people trying to fight each other... Doesn't ring a bell, so I guess that's a nice open area to to really you know make your mark. Yeah. If you're in Hollywood and you really want to write a story that's gonna you know, blow everyone's socks off, there's your niche: the the ethereal battle scene. I think Ghost Rider probably fought some other ghosts. Yeah, but he wasn't really ethereal, and he wasn't okay, actually yeah. a ghost. He's like a well, he's a spirit of vengeance in a physical habitat. Okay. Yeah. You drop him off the side of a building, and, and you know he'll crack. Yeah. Okay. As bones are frequent to do at such uh, heights. <laughs> He'll get better, of course, but, you know, it'll hurt Johnny uh, Johnny Blaze for a while. Um, but, is, yeah, yeah. Is uh, Beetlejuice, is he a physical manifestation, or is he uh, just ethereal that looks very real? He is a physical physical. manifestation. Okay. Um, very physical and quite crude. So, yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, and is the mask, no, the mask is a is a deity. Well, I consider him at Avatar, you know, sort of okay. thing. So if Beetlejuice fought the mask... Oh, boy, I want to see... I gotta, I'm going to do a Google search for that one later on tonight. Beetlejuice versus the mask. Oh, man, because you can just imagine, like, the, the, the artistic you know, skills. It's like basically, like, free range on this. Like, <laughs> I mean, yeah. it just, it, the, the comic book would just fall apart to pieces. <laughs> <It was> like, <laughs> just, be, just every page is a splash panel for like 20 pages and then the resolution happens, whatever. <laughs> Bam. Oh, yeah. That is, oh, man. That would be like the Lego of, of comic drawing. You don't have any real restrictions and limitations. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that's a good interesting note to, to leave it off on. Ghost fights and, and uh, wacky cartoon battles. There we go. Okay, well, uh, yeah, this whole time I've been Josh Trelevin. I've still been Ryan Kirkby. And uh, send money. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.